Dear students, we continue a series of our lectures. In today's lecture, we are supposed to review the Anglo-Saxon literature, as well as the Danish conquest and its influence on the language of the Anglo-Saxons from the 7th to the 11th centuries. Then we'll focus on the literature in the Norman period from the 12th to the 13th centuries. And finally, we'll consider English literature of the 14th century with pre-Renaissance a period in England being at the forefront. To start with, the culture of the early Britons changed greatly under the influence of Christianity. Christianity penetrated into the British Isles in the 3rd century. It was made the Roman national faith in the year 306 when Constantine the Great became emperor over the whole of the Roman Empire. The religion was called the Catholic Church. The word church means religion. Catholic means universal. The Greek and Latin languages became the languages of the church all over Europe. At the end of the fourth century, after the fall of the Roman Empire, Britain was conquered by Germanic tribes. They were pagans. They persecuted the British Christians and put many of them to death or drove them away to Wales and Ireland. At the end of the sixth century, monks came from Rome to Britain again with the purpose to convert the Anglo-Saxons to Christianity. And in the seventh century, the Anglo-Saxons were converted to Christianity. The part of England where the monks landed was Kent, and the first church they built was in the town of Canterbury. Up to this day, it's the English religious center. Now that Roman civilization poured into the country again, a second set of Latin words was introduced into the language of the Anglo-Saxons, because the religious books that the Roman monks had brought to England were all written in Latin and Greek. The monasteries where the art of reading and writing was practiced became the centers of almost all the learning and education in the country. No wonder many poets and writers imitated those Latin books about the early Christians and they also made up many stories of their own about saints. Though the poets were English, they had to write in Latin. Notwithstanding this custom, a poet appeared in the 7th century by the name of Cadman, who wrote in Anglo-Saxon. He was a shepherd who started singing verses and became a poet. Later, monks took him to monastery where he made up religious poetry. He wrote a poem, the paraphrase. It tells part of a Bible story. Another writer of this time was Bede. He described the country and the people of this time in his work, The History of the English Church. His work was a fusion of historical truth and fantastic stories. It was the first history of England and Bede is regarded as the father of English history. Another outstanding figure in English history and literature was Alfred the Great, the King of Wessex. Though he was a soldier, he fought no wars except those in order to defend his country. He built a, field, a fleet of ships to beat the Danes who had come again to invade Wessex. He also made up a code of law. He tried to develop the culture of his people. He founded the first English public school for young men. He translated the church history of Bede from Latin into a language the people could understand and a portion of the Bible as well. To him, the English owe the famous Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which may be called the first history of England, the first prose in English literature. It was continued for 250 years 
after the death of Alfred till the reign of Henry II in 1154. When King Alfred died, fighting with the Danes soon began again. They occupied the north and east of England and also sailed over the Channel and fought in France. The land they conquered in the north of France was called Normandy and the people who lived there, the Northmen. In the hundred years that were to follow, they began to be called Normans. The Danes, who had occupied the north and east of England, spoke a language only slightly different from the Anglo-Saxon dialects. The roots of the words were the same, while the endings were different. Soon, these languages merged with one another as they were spoken by all classes of society. The language of the Anglo-Saxons took many new words from Danish, particularly those regarding state affairs and shipbuilding. Such words as law, ship, fallow, husband, sky eel are of Scandinavian origin. The Danes were in many ways more civilized than the English. The Danes were accustomed to chairs and benches, while the English still sat on the floor. The Danes brought the game of chess to England, which originally had come to them from the east. The Northmen, or the Vikings, who had settled in northwestern France, were called Normans. They had adopted the French civilization and language. They were good soldiers, administrators, and lawyers. In 1066, at the Battle of Hastings, the Norman Duke William defeated the Saxon King Harold. Again, a new invasion took place. Within five years, William the Conqueror was complete master of the whole England. He divided the land of the conquered uh, people among his lords. With the Norman conquest, the feudal system was established in England. The English peasants were made to work for the Norman barons. They became their serfs and were oppressed. William the Conqueror couldn't speak a word of English. He and his barons spoke Norman French not pure French, because the Normans were simply the same Danes with a French polish. The English language was neglected by the conquerors. Norman French became the official language of the state and remained as such up to the middle of the 14th century. It was the language of the ruling class, of the court and the law. It was spoken by the Norman nobility but the common people of the native population kept speaking their mother tongue, Anglo-Saxon. While at the monasteries, at the centers of learning, the clergy used Latin for services and uh, literary activities. In the Norman times, real languages were spoken in the country. Until the 12th century, it was mostly monks who were interested in books and learning. With the development of sciences, such as medicine and law, universities appeared in Europe. Paris became the center of high education for English students. In 1168, a group of professors from Paris founded the first university at Oxford. In 1209, the second university was founded at Cambridge. The students were taught Latin, theology, medicine, grammar, rhetoric, logic, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. By and by, the elements of French and Latin penetrated into Anglo-Saxon. They belonged to all spheres of life, words denoting relations, religion, words connected with government and military terms, war, peace, god, council, tower, wage, comfort, beef, 
Taylor. All these words are of French origin. Sometimes the French words replace the corresponding English words. Sometimes they remain side by side, forming synonyms. A well-known example of such differentiation is presented by the names of animals, which were of Anglo-Saxon origin, and the name of the meat of these animals, which was French, such as ox, beef, calf, veal, sheep, mutton. Enriched by French and Latin borrowings, their language still remained basically Anglo-Saxon. Finally, it became the national language. Now we call it Middle English. The formation of the national language was completed in the 14th century. In 1349, English began to be studied in schools. In 1366, it was adopted in the courts of law. The Normans brought to England romances, love stories, and lyrical poems about their brave knights and their ladies. The first English romances were translated from French, but later, but later on, in the 12th century, there appeared romances of Arthur, a legendary king of Britain. In the 15th century, Thomas Mallory collected and published them under the title Sir Thomas Mallory's Book of King Arthur and of his noble knights over the round table. The knights gathered in King Arthur's city of Camelot. Their meetings were held at a round table, hence the title of the book. All the knights were brave and gallant in their struggle against robbers, bad kings and monsters. King Arthur was the wisest and the most honest of them all. The townsfolk expressed their thoughts in fables and fables. Fables were short stories with animals for characters and contained a moral. Anglo-Saxon was spoken by the common people from the 5th till the 14th century. The songs and ballads about harvest, mowing, spinning, and weaving were created by the country folk and were learned by heart, recited and sung, accompanied by musical instruments and dancing. The Norman kings made London their residence. The London dialect was the central Midland dialect, and it was understood throughout the country. It was the London dialect from which the national language developed. In the 14th century, the English bourgeoisie traded with Flanders, now Belgium. The English sold wool to Flanders, and the latter produced the finest cloth. England wanted to become the center of the world market. Flemish weavers were invited to England to teach the English their trade, but feudalism was a serious obstacle to the development of the country. In the first half of the 14th century, France threatened the free towns of Flanders, wishing to see them. England was afraid of losing its full market. A collision between France and England was inevitable. King Edward III made war with France in 1337. This war is now called the Hundred Years' War because it lasted over a hundred years. At first, England was successful in the war. The English fleet defeated the French fleet in the Channel. Then the English also won battles on land. But the ruin of France and the famine brought about a terrible disease called the pestilence. It was brought over to England from France. The English soldiers called it the Black Death. By the year 1348, one third of England's population had perished. The peasants who had survived were forced to till the land of their lords. As years went on, the French united against their enemy, 
as the king needed money for the war, Parliament voted for extra taxes. The increase in feudal oppression, cruel laws, and the growth of taxes aroused people's indignation and revolts broke out all over the country. In 1381, there was a great uprising with Wat Tyler at the head. The rebels set fire to the houses, burned valuable things, killed the king's judges and officials. They demanded the abolition of serfdom and taxes, higher wages and guarantees against feudal oppression. But the rebellion was suppressed and what Tyler was murdered. Nothing made the people so angry as the rich foreign bishops of the Catholic Church who didn't think about the sufferings of the people. The protest against the Catholic Church and the growth of national feeling during the first years of the Great War found an echo in literature. There appeared poor priests who wandered from one village to another and talked to the people. They protested against the rich bishops and also against all churchmen who were ignorant men and didn't want to teach the people anything. Such poor priests were the poet William Langland and John Wickley. They urged to fight for their rights but the greatest writer of the 14th century was Geoffrey Chaucer, who was the writer of the new class, the bourgeoisie. He was the first to clear the way for realism. The most vivid description of the 14th century England was given by Geoffrey Chaucer. He was the first truly great writer in English literature and is called the father of English poetry. Chaucer was born in London in the family of wine merchant. His father had connections with the court and hoped for a courtier's career for his son. At 17, Geoffrey became page to a lady at the court of Edward III. At 20, Chaucer was in France serving as an esquire. During 1373 and the next few years, Chaucer traveled much and lived a busy life. He went to France, made three journeys to Italy. Italian literature opened to Chaucer a new world of art. Chaucer's earliest poems were written in imitation of the French romances. The second period of Chaucer's literary work was that of the Italian influence. To this period belonged the following poems. The House of Fame, The Parliament of Faust, a poem satirizing Parliament, The Legend of Good Women and others. When Chaucer came back to England, he received the post of controller of the customs in the port of London. Chaucer held this position for 10 years. He devoted his free time to hard study and writing. Later, Chaucer was appointed knight for the Shah of Kent, which meant that he sat in parliament as a representative for Kent. He often had to go on business to Kent, and there he observed the pilgrimages to Canterbury. The third period of Chaucer's creative work begins in the year 1384, when he started writing his masterpiece, The Canterbury Tales. Chaucer died in 1400 and was buried in Westminster Abbey. Chaucer was the last English writer of the Middle Ages and the first of the Renaissance. The Canterbury Tales are the greatest work of Chaucer in which his realism, irony, and freedom of views reached such a high level that it had no equal in all the English literature up to the 16th century. That's why Chaucer was called the founder of realism. It is for the Canterbury Tales that Chaucer's name is best remembered. 
The book is an unfinished collection of stories in verse told by the pilgrims on their journey to Canterbury. Each pilgrim was to tell four stories. Chaucer managed to write only 24 instead of the proposed 124 stories. All his characters are typical representatives of their classes. When assembled, they form one people, the English people. Chaucer kept the whole poem alive and full of humor, not only by the tales themselves, but also by the talk, comments, and the opinions of the pilgrims. The prologue is the most interesting part of the work. It acquaints the reader with medieval society. The uh, pilgrims are persons of different social ranks and occupations. Chaucer has portrayed them with great skill as types, as, an, in, as individuals true to their own age. There is a knight, a young man, a nun, a monk, a priest, a pardoner, a miller, a merchant, a clerk, a sailor, chosen himself and others. 31 pilgrims in all. The knight is brave, simple, and modest. He is Chaucer's ideal of a soldier. The nun weeps in a mouse, caught in a trap, but turns her head from a beggar in his ugly rags. The fat man prefers hunting at good dinners to prayers. The merchant's wife is merry and strong. She has red cheeks and red stockings on her fat legs. The clerk is a poor philosopher who spends all his money on books. Each of the travelers tells a different kind of story, showing his own views and character. Thus, the knight tells a romance, the miller, a fable, the pardoner, a moralizing tale. Some stories are comical, gray, witty or romantic, others are serious and even tragic. I'd like to make a brief synopsis of the pardoner's tale, Three Young Men, Death and a Bag of Gold. Three young men were making merry over a bottle of wine at an inn, when they saw a funeral pass under the windows. At first, they couldn't believe in their friend's death. The innkeeper told them that the traitor Death took both young and old in the village. But the young men were a little drawn, and they understood that Dev really lived not far from the inn, where they were drinking wine, and they decided to go and kill Dev. So they joined hands and promised to be true to each other and set out. Very soon they met an old man on the road and asked him how to find Dev. When the three young men heard Dev live under the big oak tree in the little wood, they ran till they reached the tree, and under it they found a large bag of gold. Then they forgot all about Dev. They were so glad to have found so much gold. They agreed to carry it home by night, not to be seen, and robbed, and the youngest was sent for the wine and food. One of the two who were left to guard the gold decided to kill the youngest and divide that gold between two. Meanwhile, the third was thinking on his way to town to have all that gold for himself. And then he thought he would buy poison and kill both his friends. He bought three bottles of wine put poison into the third he kept poor for himself and went back to the oak tree. The two other men killed him just as they had decided. In Chaucer's age, the English language was still divided by dialects. Chaucer wrote in the London dialect, the most popular one at the time. With his poetry, the London dialect 
became the English literal language. Chaucer doesn't teach his readers what is good or bad by moralizing. He wasn't a preacher. He merely paid attention to the people around him. He drew their characters according to profession and degree, so they instantly became typical of their class. On the whole, we have tried to reveal the main and basic aspects of the Anglo-Saxon literature, which predetermined the further development of English literature.